After the Tower of Babel, God separated mankind into languages and nations and assigned each one to a heavenly being or fallen angel known as the sons of God. So what are the implications of this for us today? God assigned the nations to fallen angels, and these rogue angels are still in control. That explains a lot. So stay tuned for one of the most impactful and important episodes that we've had on this channel. Are these rulers and authorities Paul referred to as being in heavenly places? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. What we see on earth is controlled from above by a group of angels that have gone rogue. And doesn't that explain a lot of what we see in the media and from our earthly politicians. But it explains much more than that. In fact, it places Jesus' victory on the cross in an entirely new light. It makes it a greater victory than we may have ever thought. So in this episode, we're going to go back into the history of creation and the rebellion of the wicked angels to learn about the ongoing struggle between good and evil that is taking place at the highest level in heaven and how it still affects us here on earth. So stay tuned all the way through for an episode of fundamental importance. This is Nelson and because our top 30 rated YouTube channel is a community I know together we can decipher the scriptures and answer all these questions. I'll do my part and get us started with my thoughts in this video. Then you can do your part and leave your thoughts in the community comments section. In our last episode, we discussed the types of angels in heaven and concluded with this group, the Divine Council. And we ended there so we could do a more complete video on this important topic. Who are they? How do they get their power? Why did they go rogue? And what are the implications for our current world and the future? <laughs> wow, a lot to discuss. We see this council of rogue divine beings mentioned in Psalm 82.1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment, Psalm 82.1. Interestingly, the word translated God and gods are the exact same word, Elohim. One is singular, one is plural, and we can tell by the context. We see this divine counsel in other places in scripture. In Psalm 89, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Who among the heavenly beings or sons of God is like the Lord? Here we see them referred to as the sons of God. And there are passages where we see this divine counsel in action. In 1 Kings 22, the prophet Micaiah had a vision of the council. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 20. Notice the Lord assembled the sons of God in a planning session. In Daniel 4, we learn another name for this group, the Watchers. In this chapter, we learn about why Nebuchadnezzar will spend seven years reduced to the level of an animal eating grass. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. Daniel 4.17 Again, we see it as a council decision that this should take place. 
So the first question that should come up at this point is why does God need a counsel? Well, the answer is he doesn't. He's omniscient. He is all powerful. He does not need a counsel. He doesn't need humans either, but yet he has created us and entrusted us with this world and allowed us to make decisions just as he has allowed this council to make heavenly decisions. With this trusting in their decisions, unfortunately, sometimes comes bad decisions. And if we go back to Psalm 82, we see God is going to judge them for these bad decisions. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I said, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Psalm 82, 1, 6, and 7. Eventually, God plans to kill the members of the divine council for their disobedience. How did this come about? Why and when did they go rogue? And what are the implications for us all? So where did the divine council have its beginnings? Well, before the earth, actually. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So this group, the sons of God, were shouting for joy when the foundation of the earth was being laid. These sons of God, Bene, Elohim in the Hebrew, have a higher level of authority than angels, much as a son has a higher level of authority than a servant in the household of a landowner. This makes what we learn in John of great significance. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. True believers will rule and reign with Christ in a manner similar to to these heavenly sons of God right now. Wow! In fact, God created the earth for humans to rule immediately. That is why Genesis says God gave Adam and Eve dominion over it. God's original design was for mankind to govern and subdue the earth, and the sons of God were to rule in heaven, both groups under the ultimate authority of God himself. But that plan was diverted in the garden. A figure we know as the serpent approached Eve in the garden. From our last video, we learned in Ezekiel 28 that he was a guardian cherub, probably one of the cherubim who guarded and supported God's throne and probably a member of the divine council. We also learned that he fell because of his pride. So why was he here tempting Eve in the garden? Why did the serpent deceive Adam and Eve? Most likely it was to have them join in his rebellion against God. And in so doing, the humans lost their dominion over the earth. In Luke 4, we read how this dominion of the earth was then given to Satan. The devil said to him, that is Jesus, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. And spiritually, after the fall, humans became children of the serpent, no longer children of God, unless they are born again. This is a huge point. Jesus came to undo both of these issues, to eventually restore the dominion and to make it possible again for humans to be children of God. However, that's getting ahead of the story. The next monumental event in terms of the divine council is the Tower of Babel. There, the human rebellion continued as mankind attempted to make a name for itself apart from the divine name by which they should be called. God then divided them into the nations at this point. In Deuteronomy 32, we learn about this division. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. So God divided the nations into 70 
and set the members of his divine council, the sons of God, in charge of the nations. Of incredible interest is Deuteronomy 4, which says that God allotted these Elohim, or divine council members, to the nations. Beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to the people under the whole of heaven. Deuteronomy 4.19 So the idolatry of the Old Testament and even of our current day is worshiping and serving these divine council members. This is shocking to most Christians that the inhabitants of heaven are impure and that the nations serve them. But in Job we read, Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. But God set aside one nation, Israel, to be his own possession. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, is the allotment of his inheritance, Deuteronomy 32.9. So Israel was the one nation not controlled by a member of the divine council. And we know through Psalm 82 that at least some of these divine council members were corrupt and God plans to judge them. Do these members include the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece mentioned in the book of Daniel chapter 10? Almost assuredly they do. As we learned in our last video, they are princes or sar in the Hebrew. They are archangels or better still, evil archangels. And these are the evil forces Paul refers to in Ephesians 6. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, archon or archangels, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. What are the implications for nations like the USA, Great Britain, Australia, South Africa, where a large number of our viewers reside? The implication is they are controlled by members of the divine council. Now, whether the individual members responsible for these nations are good or evil remains to be seen. And what is Satan's role in this organization? In the ancient book of Job, we get a fascinating look. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, that is the divine council, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. From this we learn, Satan is part of this group and possibly the most prominent. We see in this chapter that Satan still had a right to present himself before God in heaven, at this point anyway, and could roam about on the earth as Peter tells us, as a roaring lion. Satan then accuses Job of not being as righteous as God believes he is. God gives Satan the right to test Job. We know Satan is the accuser of the brethren. This then is the type of accusing that he does. Once Satan loses his place in heaven, he'll lose this right to accuse us of not being as righteous as God thinks we are. God won't tolerate this forever. He plans to restore the world back to its Eden-like conditions. And that restoration began with Jesus' first coming, a coming and death on the cross, which took the divine counsel by surprise. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age, that is the divine council, has understood because if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 7-8 So if the divine council had known 
This act by Jesus would free humans to become children of God again and restore the dominion of the earth, they would have never done it. And the next step in that restoration begins with a war between the angels and the demons, between Michael and Satan. We'll answer questions like, is Satan crazy? What makes him think he can fight a war against God and win? <laughs> because he thinks maybe he can. And we'll find out why in the next episode. We're going to look at that war in depth in the next episode. If you want to keep watching, just click on the link right here. If that episode hasn't been published yet, another appropriate link will appear until it is published. So be sure you subscribe and click on the bell icon so you can get notifications when it does finally come out. Until then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.